Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of Office Hours. This is Office Hours episode number 61. I checked. And today, we're going to be answering three questions. Not four. Five is out altogether. We're going to answer three questions about tabletop role-playing game game mastering. It is a job which everyone thinks is hard, but is in fact just merely a little bit difficult sometimes. Most of these questions, most of these questions come to me from folks who are stuck in an unusual place. They are, they are not sure how to escape that place, and I hope that I can help them. Maybe more importantly, I hope that this advice sparks something in your brain. Uh, whether you are a game master who's been at this for years, like me, or if you are just getting started. Uh, either way, uh, here come the questions. Uh, our first question today, our first question today comes from someone I think you will recognize. Someone we've we've had a we've had a uh, a question from this this lovely human before. Hey, Adam. So, what do you think are the best ways to introduce changelings or shapeshifters as the primary adversaries in a campaign? Should the PCs know up front that changelings are a thing, or could it be handled with a slow burn reveal of strange things happening to NPCs the players know? How could I go about handling replacing a PC with a changeling and having them work the party from the inside for me? Cheers! Cheers yourself, Ashley Nova! So this is Ashley. Uh, she is a longtime member of the Math Squad and probably the person that I would go to if I had questions about Pathfinder. Ashley's a smart lady. Um, and Ashley today has questions about changelings, shapeshifters, doppelgangers, Cylons, replicants, etc. So I'm going to say this from the start. I'm going to say this right from the right from the heckin' get go. I think that. I think that shapeshifters and and Cylon type adversaries can be very tricky to use in a communal storytelling style environment. Doppelgangers are like ugh, doctorate level mimics, right? Anybody can use a mimic. Anybody can be like, haha, the treasure chest bites your face. But it's very difficult to pull off the doppelganger gambit. Now that doesn't mean we can't use them at all but it can be so much work keeping it all straight, especially when you're swapping out a PC. And now I personally would probably avoid ever using one of these types of creatures as my focus adversary, right? The, the main bad guy in like a D&D campaign especially, but used sparingly like mimics, they can be super fun. I think this is true of any sort of like, gotcha. Like, once once you've done it once, once you've pulled that trick one time, it's kind of like, um, okay, we get it. And then you, you can really, we'll talk about how we can change your campaign. But here's what I did. As a relatively recent example, and really the only time that I've done this in, uh, gosh, like probably four or five years, I've done the mimic thing a couple of times, but here's here's an example. So during Mirror Shades, uh, a, a Shadowrun campaign that I ran relatively recently, there was an enemy mage with the ability to create an illusory disguise, right? This mage could pretend to be someone else. And I only ever used this ability once during the campaign to play Dodger's character, Breakdown, into an ambush. Now, I knew as did the NPC with the spell in question, the breakdown had a kind of a thing going. And maybe more importantly, she she trusted another character, Bon Bon, uh, the Decker in the, in the group. So our enemy mage decided to sneak into their confidence, pretend to be Bon Bon using the spell, and lure breakdown away from the group. Now, I probably could have, I guess, if we were playing strictly by the game's understanding of authority, right? If we were playing this game exactly as written, I probably could have just GM my way through it, right? Letting the player's actions guide them, 
But without the cooperation of Marcus, Bon Bon's player, the immediate suspicion of, wait, why is Adam playing Marcus's character would have immediately just fucked things up. Even subconsciously, even the best players would have trouble getting around that, right? They'd be like, this has to be a dream. Or, I mean, I think seasoned veterans of Dungeons and Dragons immediately would leap to be like, nope, nope, it's not you. That's, this is, there's a bad thing happening. So before the episode started, I went to, to Marcus and I said, here's the thing. And I just, I just laid it all out. I laid it out all on the table. And I said, your character is fine. Your character is just somewhere else. I don't know. She's at the Stuckies getting a freezy pop. There is a mage pretending to be you. And once all that set in, once I had the explanation set down, I baited the hook. I said to Marcus, and this, I think this is really important. I said to Marcus, look, I will give you karma, which is the reward points of the game. If you could play this mage pretending to be you and you can lure Breakdown out of the secure hideout and onto the street. That's all I need you to do. Just get Dodger to play her character and leave the apartment building together. That's, that's all. And then I'll take over. If you could do that, I will give you a reward, right? You'll get a reward for good role-playing. And I knew Marcus would have a fun chance to be part of a secret GM practical joke that would eventually lead to... Marcus' character getting her hand chopped off. Listen, it's, you know what? It's fine. It worked perfectly. It did exactly what I wanted. It was a super fun reveal, and I never used the trick again. I've not really done anything like that in another campaign since. And I think that it worked for a couple of reasons, right? So, one, the players didn't see it coming, right? They didn't already have their suspicion up. They didn't know the mage could do that. It was brand new to basically everyone in the party. Uh, secondarily, I managed to rope in another player and invite them behind the GM screen, right? Make them secretly a part of my arsenal. And I think, especially in this case, I picked the right player, right? I knew that Wheat was dedicated more to the game than necessarily like positive success outcome for his character. I don't think I would have tried this trick with a player who is more aggressively about winning the game, right? Knowing your players is really important to try to pull this trick off. I also, I pulled the trick on the most, like, naive, like, gentle cinnamon bun in the whole party, right? Both the player and the character. Dodger was the perfect target for this particular joke. It was a perfect storm of betrayal and lies and magic spells. And the look on Marcus's face when, when we pulled it off was so good for me. That smug, like, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh, ugh. right? That, that tension was so good. Now, I can't imagine a campaign or group with whom I could necessarily play that way all the way through. Because I think if you overdo it with the shapeshifters, you end up in Battlestar Galactica or like secret Hitler territory where the whole campaign is just everyone screaming at each other for being a replicant or a fascist. And I don't really, that doesn't interest me as a campaign model. I suppose you could try to focus your whole campaign around that tension, but you'd have to pick a game that does it and a group that has buy-in to that from the get-go. You would want, nay, you would need the mechanisms of the game to be built strictly around that kind of secret, are you a replicant, are you not a replicant, that, that kind of play. In which case, you're not looking at changelings as like mere adversaries, but they're the whole concept of your game. I think it's all or nothing. You gotta go for broke. Now, if you're looking for a game that does manage some of the trust stuff, right? The secrets, the backstabbing horseshit, Check out an older RPG, small press RPG, called The Mountain Witch. The Mountain Witch. The premise of The Mountain Witch is that it is, uh, it's about a, a group of ronin in, in ancient Japan uh, traveling up Mount Fuji to fuck up an evil witch who may or may not have already co-opted members of the party. 
Uh, it has a mechanism that uses colored tokens that represent trust. There's betrayal stuff in it, secrets that you, you hide from your party. Uh, it's super cool. It's a really cool game, and it's all about that internal trust. And I feel like this sort of secret stuff has to be baked into the premise because if you try to just throw this exact same model into like Shadowrun or D&D as the main adversarial source, the game will degrade, I promise you, the game will degrade into tedium. Part of what made Battlestar Galactica as a series, because Battlestar is built on this, fun to watch was our guessing who was a Cylon and who wasn't, right? We didn't necessarily get shut out of the show when a character was revealed to be a bad guy. There wasn't this sense of us versus them, but an outside observation of everything collapsing internally. In a game, the argument about who is or isn't a secret betrayer can just get shouty and falls out of game very fast if the game doesn't have mechanisms to work it out, right? In D&D, a game whose model is more or less predicated on a non-PVP setup, right? Like, in D&D, it's assumed that the players are all, however grudgingly, allies who are combating external foes. The whole thing just goes to shit when you spend your whole time fighting with each other, out of character, or in character but with no mechanical support. The reward structure, right, economies of the game, are not built to support that, which makes doppelgangers, like, sort of sort of a bullshit thing to include to be honest like it's sort of it's sort of a, a fucky move on the part of dungeons and dragons that the monster manual doesn't include any practical mechanics or steps on how to implement doppelganger infiltration like i, I feel like that's a little unfair it's the same as including and this i'm gonna level this this at i'm gonna level this at at fucking burning wheel it's like including bombs but not giving you mechanisms for them or saying they're in and out of print supplement the point here is is that the game doesn't give you any of this stuff so let's talk about tactics on how to make it work if you do want to take it upon yourself to have the doppelgangland be the premise of your game do not do not for the love of god overdo it keep it short and sweet don't try to build your whole campaign around it because the stakes go way up and usually once the trick is pulled and discovered once the gotcha is there your group immediately will shift into paranoia mode and suddenly fucking everyone is a doppelganger barman doppelganger the the baron who gave us the quest motherfucking doppelganger fellow party members doppelgangers that doppelganger over there doppelganger Pretending to be a di different, different one. Paranoid players can very quickly lead to boring narrative. Instead of going on quests and doing fun shit, the whole game becomes about developing loyalty tests, right? This becomes the, the 10 foot pole of social obsessiveness. I do not think you can get past the gotcha. I think that the gotcha is a hard wall in this case because once you introduce the idea that no one can be trusted, that anyone could be anyone else, you will lose the ability to do anything except question that. It, it creates a sense of a paranoid trap from which I cannot imagine a group of players in Dungeons & Dragons escaping. The game does not support that. You're, you're searching for doppelgangers every five feet. So instead, use it in a campaign once or like a couple of times if you can come up with unique ways to do it. Try it on like medium difficulty first, which is to say, do it with an NPC, right? Swapping one NPC for a pretend copy of that NPC is gonna be relatively easy for you to, to handle, right? Don't go for the PC being replaced storyline right off the bat if you've never done this before. Flip-flopping NPCs can be a really fun trick and one that can do a lot for a game. You can build an entire arc around, wait, can we trust this NPC because they might be a shapeshifter? The, the thing is, if, you, if you're not ready for the paranoia, you're going to end up with a group of, your whole party is going to be Joseph Stalin, right? 
sending every NPC to the gulag or having them murdered because anyone could be a doppelganger and it's smarter just to kill that barman in case he was a doppelganger. Was it, if he wasn't a doppelganger, that's fine. Mo the witch hunt moves on. There is a sudden and intense slowdown in the pace of the game once they discover the first shapeshifter. And as far as informing your players, this is where it gets a bit tricky, right? So I'm personally of the mind that giving players more information to work with is almost always more fun than not giving them enough information. I tend to prefer games that, that have at least a, a toe in the great ocean of director stance and telling someone that they're actually a doppelganger for now is one way to, to do that. It's saying you're kind of an NPC for a little bit and I think that's okay. I think if you tell the entire group that doppelgangers are a thing and they're a big part of the game and the game is going to be about rooting them out, that's cool. But you really have to trust the group to play to that and you have to play a game that's going to reward them for it. D&D &D does not ever, ever reward you for intentional failure choices. Ever. D&D &D is a competition between the player characters and the world. And asking them to ignore the optimal choice is like telling someone who's playing poker to fold when they know they could win the hand. Why would you ever do that? So if you tell your players, this person is a doppelganger in disguise, but your characters do not know that, you are making the game more difficult for them to play correctly. Now, you can rely on entirely extrinsic rewards, but I don't see that happening easily. So again, start small, right? Go with an NPC or two getting replaced. Go with inviting a player that you know will do it well into your secret doppelganger plan. For example, if I wanted to do this with all the people that I know that I'm playing role-playing games with right now, I would choose Distracted Elf. Elf would be great at this shtick. Now, know that this kind of thing isn't for everyone and that overdoing it can be a risk to your campaign's pacing, but it's one of those rare tricks that I will say is probably better obfuscated from your players until you spring the trap, right? I don't think telling them, this person is actually a doppelganger, but you don't know it, I don't think that's going to work in most role-playing games. Because the players, no matter how good they are, they will, they will shift the way they look at that character once they know. But you know your group, right? I trust you to handle them in the scenario smartly. And in this case, unless you're playing the Mountain Witch, trust and, and replacement of character mechanics, none of that stuff is going to come from the game. So, so like the OSR, you are responsible for making that work at a player GM level. I think you shouldn't tell them, but you know your group better than I do. It's a challenge, right? But I think if you play it as like a single arc or a single adventure and not try to build your whole campaign around it, you can probably wring a couple of fun gotcha moments out of it before you move on to the, to the next thing. Good luck. This is, this is high level GMing. It's, it's a tricky business. I think you can probably pull it off, but you got to do so with, with care. And I hope that, you know, I haven't given you any necessarily concrete, specific things to do. I hope that this general guidance has at least got you thinking about it in a different way. I, I personally would shy away from it, but it's not impossible. It's a good trick. It's a fun, it's a fun thing. But. Our second question uh, focuses... It focuses inward. This is a meta question. This is a question about what it feels like to be a game master. Hi, Adam. Tomer here. Big fan of your various work. My question. Many of us GMs, after a gaming session, have those inner voices which elaborate on what we did wrong or how we failed, even when player feedback points at a game they thoroughly enjoyed. Assuming you have felt such things, what strategies do you have in dealing with GM inferiority complex, for lack of a better term? 
Thanks. Well, as a fantastically talented game master, as author of an award-winning role-playing game and successful internet personality, I've never experienced this self-doubt you speak of. Now, I can imagine this might be something other people feel, but I just can't empathize. Thank you for asking the question, though, Tomer. So our third question... No, I'm just... I'm obviously just kidding. I'm obviously just fucking kidding. Real talk, I feel... I feel that, and then throw on top of it that I'm not only trying to make a game fun for my players, but also sometimes thousands of people who are watching me do that thing. That feeling of, uh, heck, I did a, I did a crap, I did a crappy job today. I did a bad one. This was not a good session. Is something that everyone that GMs feels in some way or another. We all feel our feelings in different ways. For me, it's like, uh, I look back at a thing and I just don't, I'm like, I don't ever want to think about that episode again. Just to fucking stay away from me. Memory of the bad episode. Just please leave, leave me alone. Everybody experiences this differently. And and not just game masters, right? Not just game masters, but but players too. Right? Players feel this uh at the end of a session. I definitely have had sessions where I feel like, oh, you know, I just didn't bring my A game, or like I wasn't listening to my fellow players, or like I just I I was being pushy to get my agenda going. It like it's not everybody feels this. It's not just GMs. There's just bad stuff that sometimes happens. And it's hard, too, because you go looking for feedback, and your players are like, ah, yeah, we're having a great time. And chat's like, well, that was great. This was a fun episode. And you look at them, and you're like, you're a fucking filthy liar. That was garbage. I can feel it. That was trash, and you're lying to me because you know you did bad, and they must be miserable. And they're just keeping it from you, filthy doppelgangers. Except that I think that you're looking for a mutually exclusive thing here, and there isn't one, right? As a GM... You can feel unhappy with how a thing went. You can know instinctively you flubbed something. Maybe you fucked up a rule. You can feel awkward and crappy about your game. And your players can still be having a great time. That's the fun thing about feelings. They're not mutually exclusive, right? You can feel like you had a shitty time and didn't do well. And your players can have a great time and not even fucking notice. And neither of those things have anything to do with one another. I mean, unless you're playing in a group where your sadness is a thing your players find fun, in which case, you got problems. Y'all need Jesus. So, whatever your players are saying or feeling about the game is true. And it is real. And they can be having a blast. And your crappy feelings can also be real and true. Right? Both things. We can't affect or change, or sometimes even understand the emotions of other people in any meaningful or predictable way sometimes. So let's, let's, Tomer, let's you and me focus on you. All right? Let's talk about your feelings and what your feeling about GMing is here. So when I'm feeling like I did a bad job or like I fucked up the session somehow, or people on YouTube are telling me that I'm a game-destroying piece of shit who hates D&D. There are two things. These two hot tips make me feel better. All right? You want to know my two, two secrets? My two secrets to feeling great about my game mastering when YouTube is telling me I'm a cuck? Here they are. Self-confidence and not giving a fuck. Eh? Yeah. So, the first one's a lot harder. I'm going to start with the second. Stop giving a fuck. Just stop. Realize, deep down inside you, as quickly as you can, the game you're GMing, the session that you fucked up, doesn't matter. The rule you misinterpreted, the character you killed as a result, irrelevant. For me, this is a part of a greater understanding that nothing, anything, there's just nothing that anyone does ever that will actually matter to the universe at all. But for you, 
you don't got to go to that place. I'm just saying, look at this in terms of what's at stake, right? Look at this in terms of what's at stake. You're, you're up there busting your ass, doing the GM thing, living your life, being the, the best homer you can be. And then afterwards, you're being self-critical and worrying you're not doing your job well enough. Let's assume, for the sake of experiment, that you are indeed a tragic mess. Let's pretend, Tomer, and pretend we shall, because it's very much not true. Let's pretend that you are the worst game master in the history of time. You're just like a total fuck up, and you're terrible, and, and you just, what are you even doing with your life? Let's pretend that, all right? This is fine. It is okay. It does not matter. The stakes around this are very low. Your friends are not going to hate you. You will not lose your job. Your significant other will not sacrifice your baby to the powers of darkness because as a GM, you're about as much fun as a sucking chest wound. When it comes down to it, no RPG related fuck up is gonna be so significant that it's gonna do much more than just wound your pride. You, Tomer, are the one that is being hard on yourself. You're the one creating the conflict and the torment here. And you know what? That's okay. Because you give a shit about this. You want to feel like you are better, right? The reason you feel bad isn't because you care more about what your friends think. It's because your pride is wounded because you don't want to suck anymore. You feel like you're shit and you don't want to feel like you're shit and you want to be good. You want to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, damn, Tomer, I am a handsome individual who's good at role-playing games. And that is where we come to the second part of the solution. Self-confidence. Because the only person that you need to impress here is you. And that's both very difficult and very simple. Confidence, for me, comes from a sense of knowing deep down that I am competent and decent at what I do that I have prepared, I have done my level best, and despite the ultimate meaninglessness of attempting to do literally anything at all, I care deeply about game mastering. Caring about shit can be hard. Because if you care about something, no matter how low the stakes are, if you care about it, there will probably always be that little voice, or in my case, a chorus of voices with amusing usernames like Balls Out for Cyric, saying, Ugh, you didn't do as well at this as I expected you to. Ugh, I thought you were good. That little voice for you is internal. It uses your own speech. It's your nagging sense however overblown it might be, of your limited skill or experience. I can't advise you into a sense of self-confidence. I cannot say anything that will just turn you into a confident person about this. You kind of have to win that battle yourself. But I can help you sharpen your sword. So for me... Reflecting on shit is super important, right? For me, writing things down helps solidify them. It's why I take a lot of notes when I GM. Uh, it moves things from my internal memory into the external world and helps me make sense of stuff. So what you might do, if it sounds like writing stuff down would help, is focus on your feelings after the game. What are you feeling and why are you feeling that, right? Ignoring what your friends say, ignoring what, what chat thinks, trying to get to a place of understanding when it comes to your experience of your own feelings as the game master. When you're feeling bummed out, write down specifically what made you feel that way. 
and then give it some time to rest, set it aside, externalize it, and then be like, I'm not gonna worry about you, I wrote you down, we will return to this later. So if you have a session where you're like having a rough time with the rules, afterward, if you're feeling stressed, just note like, couldn't get my head around the vehicle combat stuff, or uh, screwed up the experience system, and then just let it go. Don't, don't try to fix it now. Don't live in that feeling of, of being a bad GM. Just write it down, externalize it, let it go for a minute, right? It happened, you can't fix it now, but what you can do is after you give the session some time away, let it breathe, come back to it, and look at ways to boost your confidence for the next time, right? Review the rules that you goofed up. Check your notes for the continuity that you, you errored out on. Do the thing that will give you confidence to handle the situation next time. Now, none of this is really GM advice, to be honest, right? Like, this is advice for trying to help yourself feel better about literally anything you don't have confidence about in your life. Practice, repetition, understanding your feelings and knowing how to feel more confident next time is going to empower you and help work out that weight that you can settle on you, right? That feeling of like, oh God, I fucked it up. We wanna help you lift that weight, right? What is it that's sapping your confidence if it's not the feedback of your players, right? What gives that internal voice the power that it does not deserve? I can't speak to your psychology, but, but doubt can come from a lot of things. And the best thing you can do is free yourself from the idea that failure as a GM is even remotely catastrophic. And then you can hone in on what you can do to bolster your shit, right? I want you to feel hype about every single session, but fucking nobody feels that way. No one on earth, I promise you, feels that way. From the GM who is doing their very first session all the way up to a seasoned pro who does it four times a week, everyone has sessions where they're like, oh, my whole life is a lie. I'm terrible at this. I'm going to light myself on fire. Do not light yourself on fire. Instead, keep at it, right? Don't give up. Don't listen to that voice that says, fuck you, quit. Make an effort to understand not just your feelings of inadequacy, but where they come from and what specifically triggers them. Tomer, you're going to be okay. You're going to improve. You're going to minimize your feelings of, of shittiness by saying to yourself, these feelings are wrong. I am good at this. I can have confidence even if I fuck up because I can unfuck the things that I am doing wrong, right? Ultimately, it's not about being, no one is just a good GM all the time. All we do is just learn to be more confident and less prone to doing the things that make us feel bad about our job, right? Everything takes time. Skill is built. And no matter what Gary Gygax or, or Matt Mercer or myself would love to have you believe, we are not magical, talented, special individuals. We're just people who care a lot about game mastering and have got a fuck ton of practice doing it. But we still feel bad sometimes. So you're not alone and you can work your way through it. You will be fine. You will improve and you will feel better about it. Our next question, uh, our next question made me uncomfortable to listen to. Um, it, is a, it is a problem that made me feel like I deeply, like, so, I'll let you listen to it and then we'll talk about it. It's, it's a long one. Buckle up. Hey, Adam. Hope you're doing well. I love this show and I never thought I would be tuning into it. But unfortunately, I've had a situation that's never come over in my several years of game mastering so far, which is an actual catastrophic meltdown that happened at the table last time we played. To give you a bit of context on the situation, I'm running for people who've never played before and we picked D&D, &D, or at least they did, just because, oh, hey, it's the game that they all heard before and there's nothing wrong with that. And I said the premise of the game is just all going to be about making conflict for their characters and putting them in 
tough choices all the time. And they went and made their characters. It was going great. We've been playing this game now for over a year. But they made, you know, just idealized versions of themselves. And it worked out great. But what ended up causing this total meltdown was Laura, one of my players. She had a Cleric of the Raven Queen, which is all about killing undead. It's an undead theme campaign. Classic. And she went and super invested in this one character this eight-year-old girl named stephanie and we're talking like spend all of her extra money from the loot on like making schools and all this other stuff this was literally the game well unfortunately this girl ends up getting killed and then being brought back as a vampire so now oh hey you need to either be a total heretic to your religion or kill the light in your life for your character so she ends up killing it but then what happened i did not expect is she just broke down crying and she was inconsolable we're talking for a good 10 minutes here and then awkward silence happened after that and everyone kind of just picked up their dice and left and not only has no one wanted to play but um, now i don't even really have a friendship with laura anymore because she, she thinks that i you know me has personally went and took it out on her for some reason and like i'm being vindictive or antagonistic towards them and I was wondering if you could have any advice for, one, getting my group back together to play with or without Laura. Because they're just so off-put about playing now after the events that happened. And, two, uh, any possible ways to possibly try to merge or heal the relationship that I had with Laura over what happened here. And if you're wondering, I asked them before the game about any problems that they could have had. So anything they don't want in the game and everyone said no you can just do whatever you want but i maybe i obviously it was not the case have a good one oh god it's it's just like it's a it's a perfect storm of like bad things right like brand new players idealized version of themselves a game in which like bad shit is going to happen to your character <sighs> So, pretty serious bleed, right, between player characters. Pretty serious bleed. And then a bunch of other kind of terrible shit that happened as a result. It can be really hard when, as the GM, we think we've done everything we can do to let our players know what to expect. We tell them the game is going to be a certain way. We ask them to establish boundaries, etc., but then someone's boundaries get pushed or they hit a place where they get upset and all of a sudden the game isn't what it was before. And I think this is the kind of situation that a lot of people are going to find polarizing, right? I suspect a lot of people hearing the question are probably thinking one of two things. They're probably thinking, man, what a bunch of jerk ass players to be so like mean to her. What a, what a jerk GM or what an overdramatic response. But I think there's culpability across the board here, and it might not be shaped the way you think it is. The thing that set all of this into place for me after listening to your question a few times, uh, Mike, was that statement that you were running the game for people who had never played before. Folks who don't know what to expect and don't know the proper or expected behaviors and situations they don't anticipate can have a really hard time consenting to difficult or uh, emotional situations. Now, I'm not saying you did anything wrong necessarily. I'm certainly the kind of GM that likes to challenge players and put them in situations where they're forced to make hard decisions. I think the scenario with the right player was great, and I'm also often in a place with players who are less experienced than I am. And I've stumbled too, right? One thing I've learned and that I'm still learning really is that players who don't have any experience with a game or with role-playing games at all have a really hard time imagining what to expect. Let's imagine, because maybe it's true if you're lucky, let's imagine you've never been slapped in the face before. No one has ever, like, open hand, full on, slapped you hard in the face. And I say to you, 
is there anything you do not want me to do? And the specific boundary of please don't slap me in the face doesn't come up for you because you don't know that being slapped in the face is even really on the table. Or maybe you don't think it's going to hurt that bad. Or it just never occurs to you at all. So then I walk up to you and I wail you as hard as I can right in the face. I just, just blast you in the face. Well, I can definitely say, well, you didn't specifically say not to slap you directly in the face as hard as I can. But that's not really fair, is it? Now, I'm not telling you that you should pull your punches necessarily or that you should try to treat your players with kid gloves or insult their intelligence by babying them. But I want to point out that saying, well, I asked them to tell me things they didn't want kind of doesn't count when you also say they're brand new to RPGs. They sort of cancel each other out here. I think that we, and I, I say we not as game masters, but I say that we as experienced players have a responsibility to new players to help them understand what the game might consist of. If you're playing Dungeons and Dragons with a group and you don't tell them that murder is on the table, that killing other people and having yourself be killed, right? Physical violence is on the table. We are failing those players. If we do not tell them, like, very bad things can, can happen to the characters that you care about, including your own character, we are failing them, right? That, that, is a, that is a thing that is really important with new players. And again, I'm not saying you didn't do this. I'm just talking about this in general as experienced, uh, as experienced players. Now, I, I just think we don't need to go as hard out the gate as we might with players who already know the game and already know RPGs and already know the group because this is a social problem too. We'll talk about that in a second. We have to help them understand what they might or might not expect so they can say, yo, I am not ready for this. We shouldn't necessarily take it slow, but we should check in as we go, right? I see you're getting really attached to this NPC. We talked about how the game is gonna be about challenging you in the things that you care about I just want you to know that it's possible that this character is going to be threatened. Is that okay for you? If not, we will we will fade them into the background, right? We want to let them know the consequences and ask if they're still committed, right? How did you do along the way with this player? Did you let her know this might happen? Did you talk to her about the dangers that might befall this character? Did you take time to express the pitfalls or the price that she might have to pay for caring about this NPC? Even so, even so, if you did a, you, even if you did like the best possible job, when it came down to it, the moment was triggering for this player and caused your friend some mental harm. And it feels to, it feels to me listening to your description when your friend was, was emotionally triggered by this thing, it feels like how you described it, y'all kind of fucking bailed on her. And then y'all kind of just fucking bailed on each other. People's emotions are hard to operate around sometimes. Especially when they are unexpected. And I cannot help but feel like, not necessarily intentionally, but within the hobby, within the space, I'm feeling like there's kind of a gendered tone to this whole thing. I don't know the gender makeup of your game, but a woman having an emotional reaction to a thing inside a traditionally masculine assumed space can be very volatile and confusing for folks. I'm not saying that anyone here is pointing fingers or saying like, this happened because this person is a woman, but I would just like to draw attention to the way that games like this interact with gender. Obviously, for everyone, this event was a lot. 
And it was a lot all of a sudden. And I wish that y'all had been in a place to say, oh, hey, okay, we're going to take a break. And as friends and co-players, we're going to talk about this, if that's something that everyone is comfortable with. The idea of a full stop, where you all just revert to being people who respect and have space for each other's feelings, is like weirdly uncommon, and sort of rare in, in gaming groups especially. More often, a jarring expression of non-game negative feelings can, as you've seen, just be too much for people to deal with. And everything just sort of dissolves awkwardly. Now, I think that there are things we can do to defer that collapse, right? To avoid the big emotional clusterfuck and just play the game, right? We can use lines and veils, which require knowing in advance what to draw lines for. Uh, we can use the X card, right, to future proof. But lines and veils and the X card are like playing, in a lot of ways, like playing chicken with triggering content. I have been in groups where the X card on the table is like a loaded gun and it's saying, I fucking dare you. I fucking dare you. Push me enough that I have to draw the X card, right? The X card, if it's real quick, uh, you write, uh, you draw an X on a card, you put it in the middle of the table. If anybody has content that they are, they feel uncomfortable about, or they are feeling like they're approaching something triggering, it can be anything. It can be like spiders. If you have arachnophobia, it can be, you're starting to feel emotionally overwhelmed, whatever. You can tap the X card and everyone's responsibility is not to talk about it, but instead to just move in a different direction. That's the X card. However, the X card can absolutely feel like, like a dare with certain groups. So it doesn't sound like that would have helped here because I don't think your player, I don't think your player knew. I don't think she knew she was gonna be that fucked up. It sounds like you wanted a game that felt like a powder keg combination of danger to the things the PCs want and care about and high stakes choice making. Right? So what steps did you and your group take to make that high stakes emotional shit safe? Like, what did you do? What structure did you build to make that possible? What commitments did you make to each other to see this intense stuff through? Because I feel like the whole approach was, well, as long as you didn't say in advance, it wasn't okay. I get to just barrel along. When your friend had a powerful negative reaction, everyone's response was awkward and negative and y'all just kind of like let her down. Nobody was ready for it. Nobody talked about what to do if you got there, even if you knew it was possible. And you had to know that was possible, right? You're not, no one is so ignorant that they, they, couldn't imagine a world where people get deeply invested in their game experience because that, that's good. That's what we want. We just have to create a space where they know they are not going to be left behind. So Meg, Meg Baker talked about this type of gameplay. And I, I think we've talked about it before. Meg Baker talked about this type of gameplay and called it, I will not abandon you. So Meg said of it, I as a player expect to get my buttons pushed and I will not abandon you, my fellow players, when that happens. I will remain present and engaged and play through the issue. I as a player expect to push buttons and I will not abandon you, my fellow players, when you react. I will remain present and engaged as you play through the issue. So I will not abandon you type play requires buy-in. You have this conversation before you play. This commitment to remaining present and engaged and not, as your group did, just awkwardly fucking fleeing the scene like cockroaches when you turn the light on is crucial to that kind of play. In the same way, had she been prepared and felt safe doing so, I think your friend could have had a cry at the table but you'd have been able to deal with it, to move through it, right? Her getting upset, you would have anticipated and been able to support her 
and she would have been able to play through it. Some of that emotion could have been funneled into her character, but what fucked this up wasn't Laura crying about her NPC and the bad situation. That is not what fucked up the game. The, the catastrophic meltdown here is not on her, it's on all the rest of you for fleeing the scene. The group fucked up, right? This is the kind of work that we need to do. These commitments, this, this structuring, checking in, this is the work we have to do if we want to have hard choices and meaningful shit in our role-playing games. If we can't make that work or we're unable to face each other when we're being awkward and inconveniently emotional, we should just stick to playing games that don't push so fucking hard, right? It's not a criticism. It's just right group, right game, right style of play. So what I think should have been done was just more work preparing your new players for the kind of game you were running. Work that maybe you didn't anticipate needing until it's too late. In this case, your players are not the only people with some ignorance to get over. You didn't know it was going to be this intense for them. You weren't prepared, and neither were they. Until it was too late, right? You didn't anticipate that until the moment had come. And that's okay. We all fuck up and if we're good we learn from our experiences and we do better next time so fucking learn from this use this as an opportunity to figure your shit out you can absolutely play games that push i mean fuck burning wheel requires this everything that the players say that they care about becomes a target for the gm and the gm's job is to push but we talk about that. It's built into our game and we make a point of engaging with that stuff. And it's hard. And when it becomes hard, we don't abandon each other. So for now, looking forward, looking towards repair and recovery, fucking say you're sorry. <laughs> like, don't equivocate. Don't say, I'm sorry, but. Don't say, I'm sorry that you felt this way. Say, I am sorry that the game got to this place, and I'm sorry that when you needed us, we all kind of got weird and just abandoned you. Don't expect an apology in return. Just say you're sorry that the game got to a place that you were not prepared to handle. That you're sorry you didn't do a better job preparing yourself and everyone else for it, but mostly just apologize for not engaging, for not sticking it out and being there for your friend. Because if I were her, I'd be pretty abandoned feeling too. I'd be pretty upset. Sometimes all this kind of thing needs is some space and some acknowledgement. If you'd stuck it out with her, acknowledge that she was going through feeling some pain, right? Acknowledging that pain, taking a break, not fleeing the scene, and then just spending some time as people, not just as characters, working out the situation, how it felt, I bet you, you'd still be playing the game. The only thing worse than feeling bad about something is feeling like you are not allowed to feel bad and are being punished for feeling bad about it. I think acknowledging that and apologizing for it is going to give your friends some space to understand that it wasn't your intent. Right? That you weren't out to make her cry and feel bad outside the game. Right? The game just got to a place that no one expected and that y'all handled it real poorly. Just own up to that. Then your friend can decide if that's something she wants to do more of. Right? Play that kind of game. Trust that you've learned from the situation. Buy back in. It's hard, right? Because you seem like you have a particular style of play that you want to engage in, and that's very cool. That's rad. I'm into it. You know what you like. It's important that we do not hurt people by doing things the way that we want to do them, and that we're open to feedback, and that we know how to engage when we hurt people by accident. Because that happens. You didn't do this on purpose. I hope that you and your group can sit down like humans who care about each other and talk it out and that you can get back to your game. I hope that you can do this with Laura. When you, my, my heart 
broke a little when you said, can we get this game, help me get this game back together with or without her. I think that the cruelest thing you can do is abandon her completely, right? It's to say, if you can't handle the campaign, you're not allowed in it, get out. We're all gonna go back to playing the game and not being emotional. That is possibly the worst lesson you can learn from this. And if you continue playing without this person, remember, you are saying to yourself and to your friends that stick around, this is okay. It is okay for us to ostracize someone who has an emotional response. In effect, you are saying it is explicitly unsafe to have emotional responses because explicitly or implicitly, we will kick you out of our group. I hope that you can find empathy for one another. I hope that you can get to a place where you can have fun and it can be a safe experience. Even when it's a brutal or intense one. For us to deserve intense emotional gameplay, we have to earn our way into that with trust safety and empathy your friend is more important than your game that's all i gotta say about that this has been episode number 61 of office hours uh thank you so much for coming everybody uh i hope that you learned something about changelings or self-doubt or complex emotional reactions in role-playing games some of these things we deal with all the time. Sometimes they come up rarely, uh, but I hope that I've helped. Uh, at the very least, I hope I've helped our, our three question askers. So uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, this, has been the, uh, this has been the episode. If you wanna get involved, if you're sitting here thinking, shit, I got some questions, Adam, I got some stuff, uh, you can submit your questions, www.adam-coble.com slash office dash hours fill out that form i will get the question and i will uh, i will attend to it in as expedient a manner as i can there are a lot of people who roll initiative before you but we'll we'll get to the questions um that's it for me everybody uh, we will see you next time for more office hours <laughs>